Hello, I'm Scruffy, and today, my friends and I would like to take you behind the scenes of producing the animated music video, Gary the Duck. From start to finish, through all the parts of production. If you haven't watched Gary the Duck, please check it out first. The link is in this video's description. Now, several people and I took part in producing this animation, but I'd say the two masterminds behind the song and the video would be Greg Blum and Ben Knight. So we're going to hear directly from them about how this all came to fruition. Let's start by handing it off to Greg and hearing about the origins and the music of Gary the Duck. Way back in 2016, being an elementary music school teacher, I had a moment in one of my music classes where a young girl expressed her desire to become an astronaut. A misinformed student blurts out, girls can't be astronauts. And I said, that's not true. Many women have been to space. It got me thinking about how, like many professions in this world, women have to fight for their rights to participate. I had been a big fan of David Bowie, and when he passed away, I was quite saddened by the loss. He often wrote about space and space travel in his songs, and one evening, while I was home alone at my piano, I started to get an idea for a new song. A song that told a story about an aspiring astronaut. I was thinking, what type of being might have to fight for their rights to fly into space? Maybe a duck? But what's his name? My mind went to my Uncle Gary. He was very supportive of my creativity, and he was a big fan of my music. I said it out loud. Gary the Duck! The song just started pouring out. I reached for the notebook I always keep near my piano, and I tried to write all the words down as fast as I could so I wouldn't forget them. In one 30-minute sitting, I had written most of the song. I finished it a few days later. As I sang the song, right away, I could see a whole movie in my mind. It was instantaneous. I knew it had to be animated. But before you can make a music video for a song, you first must record the song. I actually recorded Gary twice. The first time, I used the software Logic Pro. I start by finding the speed of the song. Then, I record the main keyboard part. This component determines the song's harmony and chord progression. Next in the process, using a microphone, I tracked a scratch vocal that has my voice singing the words to give the plain chords some context. Once I have a foundation for the song, for me, the fun begins. I then start to layer as many musical ideas as I can think of. I like to add all sorts of synthesizers and drum beats. I was working in the box, meaning all of these instruments were software-based MIDI samples. I was not recording with live instruments. The second time I recorded the song was with Tommy King. We recorded my entire album at Tommy's house. He had turned most of the whole house into an amazing analog recording studio that utilized tape machines and Pro Tools. This time, we recorded almost entirely out of the box. We used all live instruments, real piano, real drums, real guitars, and real analog synthesizers. We followed the same process of layering tracks starting with the original MIDI keyboard part I recorded before. Then, a new scratch vocal on one of Tommy's cool mics. It was time to add drums and it quickly became one of my favorite songs I've ever recorded drums for. Tommy suggested, instead of just coming in with the beat straight away, I should do a little drum solo to enter the song. This was so fun, and it added a lot of excitement to the first chorus. Up next, my good buddy and outrageous guitarist, Zane Carney, contributed several guitar parts, one of which ended up becoming the main riff that you hear at the beginning and the end of the song. They remind me of bookends for the story. 
Danny McKay played bass on the song, grounding the mix with the low notes. One of my former musical students, Isaac Wilson, played the piano. Listen for it closely in the second pre-chorus when Gary leaves his home and gets to fly into space. The piano really helps tell the story in this section. Tommy added a whole bunch of awesome synthesizers, which was such a joy to witness. You can really hear the David Bowie influences in the bridge of the song. Finally, the vocals were recorded, including the great Charles Jones on the backing quack quacks. Quack quack. After recording all of the instruments and vocals, I brought the musical layers or stems to professional mixer Rick Parker. When the song was first mixed, the drums sounded too modern for my liking. Almost like ones you'd hear in a song that was made in the 80s. Rick then helped us make them sound drier and less in your face. Tommy and I much preferred that. The song went through six versions with Rick making small adjustments each time until it was done. After two years of recording and mixing, the song was done and a student of mine at the time was about to graduate eighth grade. His name was Ben Knight. I had remembered seeing Ben quickly whip up a beautiful picture on Photoshop as album artwork for his song he made in my class. Little did I know that Ben was an amazing animator. I approached Ben and I told him I have a very special song that needs an animated music video and I asked him if he would be open to collaborating on a project. And I wanted to know what I was getting into, so I said, send me the song. I listened to it, and instantly I had a ton of ideas for where it could go visually. I decided to make a really, really rough storyboard, just sketching out the whole film as simply as possible so that I could get ideas from my head onto a page quickly. Greg and I met a couple times to discuss our ideas and goals for the project, and to share concept sketches. Greg's storyboards were much nicer than mine. Looking back, it's interesting to see what things we kept from those discussions and what we eventually scrapped. At some point, I think we thought that if we worked really hard, we might be able to finish the whole thing by the end of the summer. Um, that turned out to be just a bit naive. For the rest of the year, we slowly kept trading ideas and art, but I didn't feel confident enough to really start the project. I was just starting high school, so pretty quickly I became way too busy to work on Gary. But in January of 2019, I spent a couple of weeks putting together an animatic for the whole film. I made new storyboards and edited them together into a watchable movie. Even though I still kept it really sketchy, it was cool to be able to watch the whole thing from beginning to end, timed to the music. Although we simplified some things here and there, this version more or less follows the pacing and editing of the finished product. Around this time I also made a test animation, just to prove to myself that I even could animate this character. By April of 2020, more than a year later, I was getting more confident in my art skills, so I decided to try my hand at designing a background, a town for Gary and his family to inhabit. My sister Evie and I sketched out the houses on paper. We were inspired by some of the house designs in Animal Crossing New Horizons, which had just come out at the time. One of us had the idea to make the awnings of the houses look like little duck bills, and that just seemed perfect. I started working on it in Photoshop. The first thing I did was just collect a ton of reference images. I wanted to make the town feel like it was set in a place where ducks might actually live, so the idea of making it a marsh-like environment seemed like the right direction to take it. First, I scribbled a bunch to figure out the basic composition of the shot. No need to make it look pretty here, I was really just making this for myself. Once I had a rough composition that I was happy with, I made another layer and drew what I started calling a detail sketch, this time paying close attention to the perspective, silhouette, and forms of each object, but not worrying at all about line quality. I would use perspective guides to make sure I had everything lined up correctly and kept the horizon line low to make it look dynamic. I'm also making sure to flip the canvas often so that I can see how my art might look to someone who hasn't been staring at it for hours. The final step is to draw the line art. Now that I had the whole thing meticulously planned out, I just had to trace it with a brush that I liked. Splitting it up into steps helped keep the mental load down. 
It never felt like the stakes were high at any particular point, so I never got overwhelmed. I was really proud of how this background turned out. So, feeling motivated, I met up with Greg to come up with a plan for getting the entire film done. We made a shot list based on the animatic, simplifying as much as we could to try and alleviate some of the work. Still, giving myself a generous amount of time for each stage of production, I estimated that the whole thing would be finished by late 2022. We were hoping to finish a little sooner than that, so it became clear that I couldn't do this alone. I decided to take a page out of actual animation production pipelines and split the creation of backgrounds into two steps. Background layout, which is the design and line art of each background, essentially what I did with that town background, and background paint, filling each background with color. I'd spend the summer making as many layouts as I could, giving priority to backgrounds that were essential to animating shots. And as I finished them, I'd hand them over to our background painter, Mara. As the background layouts were completed, I was able to download them and paint them with Photoshop. Working on backgrounds, I learned how essential the right tools are to achieving the perfect painting style for Gary the Duck. I downloaded many brushes from artists who provided them online, and I made some brushes myself. The backgrounds were given to me in layers, so of course I had to paint in layers. This took planning and a little bit of strategy. I'd paint objects in the layout's foreground first, before moving onto layers further back, and so on. I made sure to organize them into folders with both the paint and the line art layers. Ben provided me with color keys, little low detail versions of the bigger background layouts meant to convey the color he was envisioning. I would use these as a primary source for selecting the colors to paint every object in the background. That said, sometimes I would add my own complementary colors if I felt they were needed. My favorite background to paint was a NASA spaceship. It was a background I felt I was the most detailed and creative in. I was able to add texture of my own and experiment with lights and glowing color, something I've never done before. Painting the layouts for Gary took over five plus hours sometimes, depending on the complexity of the layouts. I would often finish one in half a day and the other half another day. As a traditional painter, something I found interesting was that digital painting is more forgiving than traditional methods. With the right tools and brushes, it feels as if the backgrounds and textures come together by themselves in a more fluid way, especially when using more than just the standard digital brushes. I would often mix media and use pens, spray paint tools, and digital oil paint to create texture. Erasing paint was never this easy traditionally. This isn't to say that digital art is simple, though. Learning the techniques for how to make something digital look high quality took me a lot of time and practice. This project taught me a lot, but just to scratch the surface, two things that stuck with me were learning tools and shortcuts to save major time and exploring color theory by using colors you wouldn't typically think objects would be. That was new and eye-opening for me. Working with this team and with Gary, I learned that beyond this project, any color for anything is possible. We just have to be creative. So with Mara painting the backgrounds, I'd have enough time to finally get going on the animation. Except, actually, there was one more thing that needed to get done first. The model I made for Gary was from almost three years ago. The way that I drew him had changed a lot in that time and I wasn't very happy with it anymore. So I redesigned Gary to give him more of an identity. An important part of character design is shape language, using simple shapes to communicate how the character comes across to the viewer emotionally. Pixar, among many other studios, is famous for its numerous uses of shape language. So with that idea in mind, I decided to pull from Greg's lyrics. During the bridge, there's a part that goes, as he orbits through the sky, his wing wipes tears from his eyes. Gary is this tiny being within a vast, sublime universe, so beautiful that he can't help but cry. That line struck me as being particularly powerful, so I decided to build Gary out of a bunch of teardrop shapes. You can see that motif in his head, body, bow tie, eyes, beak, and feet. 
I also took the tuft of hair from his original design and pushed it to the extreme to give Gary a more recognizable silhouette. This updated design for Gary actually ended up changing quite a lot by the time I finished animating, but this worked well as a base. So that was one character down, but there are a lot of supporting characters in Gary the Duck, and by this point I really needed to get started on the animation. So for the other characters, I turned to my sister, Evie. She's always had an amazing eye for shapes and design, so I knew she'd be up to the task. I spent the better part of my life glued to my Wacom tablet, so when Ben asked me to design characters for Gary, I was fully on board. I think the first character I worked on was Gary's mentor, who we lovingly dubbed NASA Lady. In the original animatic, they had this little hairdo dad, a little swoopty swoop, that pretty much inspired their entire design. We wanted them to be the kind of boss the astronauts would look up to, you know, like, oh my gosh, they're so cool. The other more mainish character was Gary's mom, Mommy the Duck. She was the first other duck design I made, so she defined what they would look like. As for those other ducks, Sherry, Gary, Barry, Mary, Mary, Harry, Terry, Larry, and Babies the Duck, their challenge was simultaneously meshing with Gary's style and making sure he stood out against them. Turns out, giving them dot eyes goes a long way. Other than that, they're pretty much all just different sizes and combinations of circles mashed together to make cute looking duck babies. Add in a reference to one of my favorite movies, have all the closer members of Gary's family wearing bow ties, and give them all a pleasing pastel palette, and they're done. Then there's the other background crowd, the peeps at NASA. These guys are pretty much just simplified classic astronaut designs, keeping in mind that circle theme we've got going. Round shapes feel real friendly and inviting, so that made it the perfect vibe for this short. Basically, everyone had to pass the test of looking like you just want to squish them. So while Evie was designing the characters, I was finally getting to work on animation. But where to start? Well, the animatic from 2019 was starting to look a little outdated. I needed to be able to work off of something with the backgrounds I had made, so I figured redoing the animatic digitally would be a good first move. I didn't feel like storyboarding the entire film all at once again. So instead, I split the film into four parts, and got each part fully animated before moving on to the next one. There's the beginning, where Gary is in his hometown, the journey, where Gary goes to NASA and heads up into space, the bridge, where Gary looks inward and completes his emotional arc, and the finale, where we see how Gary's actions have impacted everyone who helped him along the way. I started with the bridge. To motivate myself to get to work, I put up a big sheet of paper on my wall and drew boxes to represent each shot. I'd fill each one in with different colors of post-it notes when each shot reached a certain milestone. Blue for storyboarded, yellow for rough animation, and green for final line art. So I made an Adobe Animate file and imported the song. Once the section is storyboarded, I can split that Animate file into smaller files for each individual shot. In each file, I have layers for the animatic, which lets me easily reference the composition of each shot, the audio, so I could time out my animation to the music, and the background, which is important for knowing where the character is allowed to move on screen. When I started animating, though, the questions of how do I start and what next weighed down on me. I was overwhelmed at the prospect of actually making something that would end up in the final video, so I would procrastinate a lot. And when I did finally finish shots, I wasn't particularly happy with them. I'd leave out details like Gary's tuft of hair because I just couldn't figure out how to do them in a way that looked good. But then I remembered that for the backgrounds, I would try to only focus on one problem at a time. Strictly adhering to this philosophy got me out of feeling overwhelmed. So for the animation, I'd first sketch out the motion then tie it down and add some in-betweens, and then fill in the details. Once I had a few shots under my belt, it got easier and easier to make more. By the end of the project, I was animating multiple shots a day. So if I had one piece of advice to give, that would be only focus on one thing at a time. That's an important philosophy in animation. Even with so many problems to solve in a project like this, breaking it down into one step at a time means you can complete each step as effectively as you can. And once a shot was animated, the next step would be cleanup. 
redrawing the lines of animation to be as clean and consistent as possible. This part is a very one problem at a time step. It's just tracing previous lines, so it's less daunting work, more just time consuming. That's why Ben ended up splitting up cleanup and background work, delegating it among himself, Mara, Evie, Greg, and me. So I guess there were times when we were solving five problems at a time, just by strength in numbers. And I should mention, not every shot was 2D animation. Gary needed a spaceship to fly, and some of the shots were exclusively of his spaceship flying. So Ben had me design a 3D model of a spacecraft for him to use. The references I had were these beautifully detailed illustrations of the spaceship's interior for other shots. Especially this one, the pivotal shot of looking out at Earth, that pill-shaped window stuck with me a lot. So starting from the window shapes, I sketched a spaceship with a pretty simple but striking beak-shaped design, and then I built it in Blender. Initially I gave it some colored textures, but it ended up being more effective to render it with Blender's freestyle outline feature basically creating cleaned up line work of our 3D object, and then lowering the frame rate so it looked more in line with the rest of the 2D animation. Okay, now I'll hand it back to Ben to show how we finalized these cleaned up animations. Once I had every shot in the film cleaned up and colored, it was time to start compositing in After Effects, taking everything we had, putting it all together, and polishing it. Because After Effects and Animate are both made by Adobe, I can open animate files directly in After Effects. This lets me manipulate each layer separately without having to export anything. And I can scale my animations without any pixelation, since it's all vector-based. The first thing I do when compositing is remove the temp backgrounds and replace them with Mara's finished paintings. Then I'll add some color tinting to the characters to make them better fit in the world, while making sure they contrast with the background. Finally, I'll add some extra lighting. Sometimes in animation, animators will manually hand draw the light sources as part of the production pipeline. We didn't do that for Gary, but I still wanted some sense of three-dimensional light in the film. So I opted for a much quicker, but still visually nice looking technique called inner shadows. I add the inner shadow layer style to the characters, choose the color that I want the light to be, and then change the blend mode from something subtractive to something additive. I found color dodge to work the best for most scenes, since that didn't affect the black outlines around the characters. For some scenes, I added additional effects to make the environments feel more grounded. For example, in this pool shot, I added some distortion in the background to mimic water refraction, some glow to show that the light is scattering in the water, and finally, I duplicated Gary, silhouetted him, set the blend mode to multiply, and applied the CC light burst effect to make it look like Gary was casting a shadow onto the water. This is what the film looked like before compositing, and this is what it looked like after. That's the power of compositing. Oh, and one more thing before we wrap up. Not all of Gary the Duck was animated digitally. The fantasy sequence at the end of the bridge is all drawn on paper. Ever since I first storyboarded the film, I thought it would be interesting to convey Gary's thoughts as children's drawings, using colored pencil. Now it was time to actually get that scene done, and it was nearing the end of the school year. My old elementary school's art teacher didn't have much lined up to teach in the last few weeks. So with her help, Greg and I managed to quickly put together a class to teach the fundamentals of animation, where each kid would get to draw a frame of animation for this film. In the end, almost 200 students across four grades spent a few minutes each tracing over a frame of animation that I produced, using whatever colors or patterns they saw fit. For the last shot, I told them they could just draw whatever they wanted on the page, so every frame has a completely unique design, representing the cacophony of emotions that Gary is feeling. Once the drawings were finished, I took pictures of them using a camera mounted to a down shooter, lined them all up in After Effects, and then applied some color grading to make them look as clean as possible. Out of curiosity, I wondered what would happen if I inverted the colors, and suddenly, everything clicked. The fibers and dust in the paper that annoyed me before now looked like both stars in outer space, and the patterns you might see when you close your eyes, almost like Gary is dreaming. I also realized that the drawings themselves now evoked Emile Cole's Phantasmagory, 
the 1908 cartoon often considered to be the first traditionally animated film. Cole would draw black lines on white paper and then shoot it onto negative film, basically the same technique I was using in After Effects. Gary the Duck became this celebration of animation, employing modern techniques like the CG with Gary's ship, while calling back to the earliest uses of the medium with this sequence. Put some glow in for added dreaminess, and apply some final color grading, and the effect was complete. After four years of hard work, Gary the Duck was finished. We all got on a Zoom and watched the film together. It's been five years since I started working on Gary the Duck, and I'm so excited to finally be able to show it to everyone. I got to do everything I wanted with this project, and I couldn't be happier with the result. After working on this project for a couple years, I thought it was really cool to see Gary evolve from where he was in the beginning to now. The evolution of the character design and colors and themes have been drastic, and I'm just so excited for everyone to see this animation. I couldn't be happier with the team and how it came out. The funny thing is, Gary the Duck has kind of been there for all of my childhood. Even just if I wasn't working on it, it was always this thing in our house that we always knew about. It's just kind of funny that I ended up working on it and it just became something that I could be proud of. And also, I'm just incredibly proud of my brother and everyone else on the team. We all worked so hard and I'm so happy with how it turned out. And thank you so much for watching it. I've always imagined creating an animated music video for my songs. And to be able to see one complete that I got to collaborate on with such kind and talented people has been a dream come true for me. What initially started as a small passion project has blossomed into, in my opinion, a masterpiece. And it's definitely the coolest piece of art that I've ever been a part of. I'm so proud of our crew and the Gary the Duck video. I hope you enjoy watching. And I just have to express how proud and grateful I am to be on this team, to have created something so uplifting and such a great work of art. And I'm really thankful for having you all in this video. Thank you so much for recounting your process and your thoughts. Before we go, here's where you can find the Gary the Duck team online. You can find me on Instagram at Evangeline the Dinosaur to see some illustrations, character designs, and an absurd amount of fan art I do. <laughs> I have a YouTube channel called Night Owl, where I very occasionally make videos about topics that interest me. And there you can find links to my other social media pages. You can find Gary and all my other videos on my YouTube channel in the link below. And be sure to follow me at G to the Blum on Instagram. Also, check out all my other songs on Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever you stream music. And Mara asked that her links be put in this video's description. So head down there to find her social media and all the aforementioned links. And finally, I'd like to thank my patrons on Patreon, who help keep my video making process sustainable. If you'd like to support my work directly and get perks like your credit here, seeing videos early, a vote on what music I arrange, and other behind the scenes content, you can visit my Patreon with the link in this video's description. And with that, I'm Scruffy, and thank you very much for watching. Bye! Bye.